Welcome to New Mexico Black Rifle Operators Union. I'm your host, Sean. Today, I wanted to talk about the representatives fighting back for our rights uh, in, Ken- I think it's Kentucky? No, it's Alabama. In Alabama, there is a U.S. congressional uh, representative who has introduced H.R. 1095 to declare the AR-15 style rifle chambered in 223 uh, Remington or 5 Five six by five five six NATO to be the national gun of the United States. Now, what does this mean? <clears throat> In short order, we're seeing our reps, national reps, and city uh, state reps finally get some stones. Um, Barry Moore, what he's done is he's introduced a protection specifically crafted. In their uh, state senate, or their state, uh, their Alabama's version of the roundhouse. Sorry, I was looking at the roundhouse's update too, um, for New Mexico. Anyway, this protects the AR-15. So in no short order, he's declaring it, having this, the bill he's introduced, the legislation he's introduced, is saying, hey, this is a protected class of firearm, because this is in exactly what it was intended for, was for us to stop, uh, I say us, us, us citizens, to stop a tyrannical government, um, and also to defend ourselves. They also acknowledge that this is, uh, in this legislation, they acknowledge that this is the most popular ha- rifle in the United States. It is America's gun. Um, we've talked about that. What I think is hilarious is this is after a place like Illinois even has introduced Senate Bill 2106, I think it was, that I was talking about a little bit ago, like last week or a week before last. What that does is it actually says you have to know something before you can pass a piece or introduce a piece of gun legislation. I wish um, New Mexico had such a thing because, holy crap, man, were they talking out the sides of their ass when they were trying to do... uh, the most recent legislation in New Mexico surrounding Senate Bill or House Bill um, 101, Senate Bill 171. Speaking of which, in New Mexico, what the what we've got going on, and this is from New Mexico Shooting Sports Association again. Um, today on Monday, which is today, okay, um, they are going to be hearing House Bill 9 in the Senate, so it hasn't been drafted or sent it is already passed on the house side house bill 9 is the safe storage of firearms for um act basically it means you can't have a gun out in public or in well not in public that isn't secured or locked down um the idea behind this is that they're trying to curb school shootings or mass shootings by denying access to um firearms for kids now on the surface, that sounds like a great idea. I, I totally agree with the idea um, for a lot of things. However, and my kids are a heck of a lot older now, and I'm <clears throat> we've had a lot of discussions about something like this. But we live in the, the Southwest, and I say this all the time. We also live in a place where response times are a hell of a lot longer. And I trust my 18-year-old um, college graduate now a hell of a lot more then I would trust, you know, a normal kid. Um, same with my 16-year-old. My 16-year-old has some has some issues, mostly around depression, mostly, and he's the one I would be worried about, or you would think I would, except for he is not a violent kid. Um, you have to push, provoke him, and, you know, I hear all this stuff, you know, that's those are warning signs for what, what happens. Well, this is where your parents step in. This is where us parents step in. And both his mom and I are on the same page, and we check and watch out for my youngest all the time. And it isn't... I think COVID broke my son, my youngest son. Uh, My youngest son was a very flowery, outgoing person. um, And I think that the lockdowns and having to deal with being secluded and then having to deal with your entire life as a kid getting it disrupted was hell on him and we're still fighting the battles that have happened because of the covid lockdowns with my son my youngest one with that 
he doesn't have ready access to firearms. The firearms in the home where he stays are secured, and that's how they would be here also. Um, when he's stayed here, I have made sure that even my concealed carry gun is on my person at all time, or locked. everything else was locked under key. This is what responsible people do. So House Bill 9, I think, is ne is negligent. It's, it's forcing an undue burden on particularly the poor, um, because maybe they can't afford a safe. And maybe they've done what I've done with my kids at a very young age and started teaching them what the hell's going on. And if you can't um, lock up all your firearms, which you should, um, that's just part of being a good gun owner, um, hide, get rid of the ammunition. Hide it. Lock the ammunition up. The ammunition is a hell of a lot easier to deal with than a gun is. And if you take away the opportunity to any, for anybody to get the ammunition... Uh, the only ones that are interested in a firearm at that point are just people that are trying to steal them. And at that point, that's where you should have pictures of all your guns and their serial numbers, like I do, saved in the cloud, like I do, just in case you ever have to make an insurance claim or you ha ever have an issue. But it's nice and refreshing to see people starting to, to come around. Now, House Bill 9, I think, is useless. I've, I've talked about this. I think it's a uh, constitutional violation, uh, mostly because, like I said, we live in the Southwest. A lot of people in rural areas, uh, younger ones, are kind of farmhands, too, after they get out of school. And them having access to a tool to stop a predator, that seems kind of stupid not to allow that. Uh, especially growing up around ranchers and farmers. And again, I'm biased. I know I'm biased on this one because I've shot a lot when I was a young kid. And that was a, a way my brothers and I would get out of the house and my we kind of bonded over. Um, to this day, my brother and my older brother and my younger brother, we talk about the stuff that we did in my brother's old Chevy Citation after school. Um they were 16, 18, that type of age when I was like, you know, 12. Okay, they're they're easily older than me by a lot. Um, well, probably even younger than that. I was probably eight or nine. But I've been shooting with them. They'd been taking me out since my dad adopted us, uh, adopted me. Um, my brothers were his, are my dad's biological kids. And... In my family, that didn't matter. Uh, my brothers picked me up. We went fishing all the time. Uh, my brother Rick was the one that gave me my first rifle, which was a 22 Remington uh, nylon. I'm going to find another one of those. It's number eight or nine on my list that I have to have back before I pass away. Um, but it, there's a lot of connection there. So you see why I would oppose this. Senate Bill 171 in New Mexico's Roundhouse is the... Companion Bill to House Bill 101. So if you don't know what House Bill 101 in, in New Mexico or the Roundhouse is, there's one, it's basically Dianne Feinstein's ban brought to New Mexico, um, which they reintroduced in the national level too, so do not get this confused. If you're listening to this and you're one of the national listeners, which I'm beginning to get a lot more of, um, so we're slowly growing the cast. Again, thank you very much for that. Um Let's see, Senate Bill 114. Okay, so what is Senate Bill 114? I had to look this one up because I haven't been paying attention as closely because I've been trying to get everything lined up for my business and doing the last bits of commitment I made while I was jobless so I can get stuff on eBay lined out for my friends that have, you know, gave me a crutch when I needed it. So I'm fi finishing that out. Um... But Senate Bill 14 is a, a really stupid bill. It was, well, actually a really good bill if it gets passed. And why I say that is it would be a really stupid reason not to pass it, but I could see they're already trying to pass other stuff against this one. Senate Bill 114 amends the law that they're in New Mexico that if you were a brewer or a winery, they allowed you to carry a firearm into the restaurants that were that type of establishment. Well, there was a, a piece of uh, wording, sort of some verbiage in that 
uh, original bill that said only if they serve this. They don't want you to have any of the hard liquor or have access to it or in the restaurant or be around it, more so specifically around it. Um, so they've, they're trying to amend it with Senate Bill 114 that allows you to still be in a restaurant that serves that type of stuff and conceal carry. Senate Bill 44 is no open carry in the polling place, no concealed carry in the polling place. I don't think this is a big deal. I think this is a political grab from the left. What they're seeing, what they're afraid of is intimidation. Um, I understand the intimidation factor for going to the roundhouse, and I spoke about this before, or going to the Senate or the uh, Capitol with a firearm. And done in mass, it makes a very big statement. But if you go to a pub uh, protest and there's only like, you know, maybe 20 out of the 200 that are carrying firearms out and open in the public, it sends a wrong message in my opinion. It sends to the people that are very afraid of firearms that the people that use them are um, kind of intimidating. Now, I have... The only heartburn I have about that is that I want to try to attract people to our side and teach them the cool parts about the 2A. Personally, I like the fact that that sends that intimidation message a little bit because it puts the fear of God back in these people. Because up to this point, they don't have any. And that that would be my only opposition to it. If we're in the roundhouse and you're trying to make a statement it's probably not a good plan to have my AR-15 or my Kalashnikov strapped to my side. And I've always thought open carry was a little okay. Um, when I say okay, I mean that in a derogatory term. The reason why is it usually means you can be identified as a target right off the bat. Um, I'm all about concealed carry, but I'm also about constitutional carry. And in New Mexico, it is not illegal for you to walk down the street with an AR-15 strapped to your chest. And I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, I'm also perfectly fine for the person that carries their 1911 and they're dressed to the nines to go out and that's their their dress gun. Okay, There's a place for that. That's what's cool about the 2A. Um, there's also a lot of people that just, we live in that rural environment that it makes sense to open carry because they want always to have access to it. So I have no problems with open carry. And it sounds like I do because of what I said just a little bit ago about going to the roundhouse. Is if you're in committee meetings, it would be distracting. And they would be really on edge so we can't have those conversations we need to have. More often than not, what's killed us in the 2A is we've had conversations, but our conversations usually lead to more degradation of our rights. I'm still hopeful that we can stop some sort of bad stuff from happening in the future, but not as hopeful as I once was. Um, what I see now is that uh, our representatives and our senators, not just in our state, but also across the country in multiple states and even at the national level, are sick and tired of the crap and they're starting to push back a little bit. Now, I have about as much trust in any politician as I do um, crossing a street to some degree. And what I mean by that, let me explain. I check left and right before I cross the street like you're supposed to. But I check it as I'm walking across the street. And I kind of look up to see if the plane's going to fall and hit me on the head. So I don't trust anything about the politicians doing this. And I don't... It, it's a good feel-good... Piece of a uh, legislation to to introduce something like this to say, hey, the AR-15 is a national gun of America. It is. Um, it does need protections. Um, I, I firmly believe this would be a pathway to get those protections. I firmly believe this would be a pathway to get those firearms with the giggle switches back in our hands, which should have happened a long time ago. Especially when we can leave them for the Taliban. And Russia is now buying our weapons from what we left in Ta Afghanistan. So there is that, you know. Why are Ukrainians getting our top-of-the-line weapons to defend themselves 
from a government, I know why they're getting it. It's because the Russians rolled across their border. But what about the American citizens? Am I not entitled to the same level of protection, even if I'm willing to pay for it myself, without getting any government entanglements around that? Um, assault weapons, quote-unquote assault weapons, I call them black rifles, they're used in less than 3%, or rifles in general, long guns in general, are used in less than 3% of all crimes. Most gun deaths are caused by suicide. And suicide is something I have a very intimate uh, knowledge of. I am a survivor times two of suicide. Um, it, you have to change your mental attitude. And the only way you do that is with some intervention from the people around you. Now, I was very fortunate that I got some intervention, and I got uh, one of my best friends stopped me the first time this, that I attempted this. The second time, I attempted it. A failure to fire saved me. So, divine intervention. So, why am I sharing that with you? Is that there's a level of, of care... And that you have to have with firearms, that if you're really dedicated, died in a wool gun guy like I am, that you're willing to go get some help. Because to be honest, at those points in my life, there were other factors that I just wanted it to go away. Um, hindsight now, getting some therapy, getting on some antidepressants when I needed them, I'm no longer on that either. Um, Leaving my job in the district has been a good deal for me. I am no longer on blood pressure meds because they're not needed. I'm no longer on antidepressants because my anxiety is at an all-time low. Um, I find myself, as I say, chasing my own joy, doing exactly what the hell I want to do. This is one of those things. So I see a lot of this stuff as superlative. It's not necessary. And what really bothers me about this is that is how one side of the aisle tends to deal with the American people. And the other side is more of a speed bump to stop that from happening than, rather than actually stopping it completely. And it's time that that changes. We need more Freedom Caucus people like Matt Gates, Lauren Boebert. You know, those are the most controversial ones, but if you actually get to meet them or get to hear them speak, that's why I recommend TimCast. That's why I chose this article, was to highlight TimCast News and T, uh, TRL, uh, TimCast uh, Real Life, so you can watch it Monday through Friday, um, 6 a.m., or 6, not 6 a.m., 6 p.m., um, Mountain Time. That's usually starts at 8 p.m. their time. There's also an after-hour show where they get a little more spicy and a little more down in the news if you join TimCast. But they're, they seem to be willing to have conversations that most people won't, even around the 2A. And some of them are very much in line with my thought, and some of them not necessarily. Um, and when I say that, you are legally, in my opinion, and Tim's opinion, you are legally allowed to own a nuclear weapon. Now, people, you say that, and it's a shock to everyone. But let's look at what it would take to, to own one in reality. I mean, the American military does it because they have billions of dollars, or they have our tax dollars to allow that to happen. Maintaining a weapon like that would be cost prohibitive to even some of the richest guys in the United States or in the world. Um, plus, you would... Uh, the chances of you using it are slim, but it would be a really big deterrent to the federal government knowing that it would come from their own people. And the more that they've, uh, I've existed in the United States, the more I realize that we aren't as free as we'd li we should be. And our founding fathers probably roll around in their graves a little bit by how, much, uh, how many concessions not only the Senate and the reps give, um, or the president, but how much, how many concessions the United States, uh, the American people have? Um, I don't see the level of taxation being acceptable that we've had in the United States, because in the early 1700s or the late 1700s, sorry, I, I'm just thinking just the century, 
But in 1780, you know, 1787, when we finally became a, an actual country, you could own all these firearms. And it kept people honest. Because we had just cast off the, you know, the crown, King George's bull crap, to become a United States. Um, and they, the whole purpose of this, and the Articles of Confederation that they had originally drafted, and the federal uh, the federal Federalist Papers that were originally held to constitute the United States are more in line with where we should be right now, I believe, than where we are. Because we've had our House and our Senate compromised for a long time. Um, and it's not just the House and the Senate in New Mexico or at the federal level. It is the lobbyists that are around it and the swamp, as it's called, I would say the deep state exists live and well in politics. And it's done because huge companies or huge investors, that's a, that, this is calling what they are, lobby for their product to be safe or they start taking political stances like Soros does and says, uh, we don't want guns on the street. Um, their idea is always prohibition, and never in history has prohibition worked. There are countless examples of where banning of firearms has led to huge loss of life. And while the left seems to be focused on that one contingent, that that is the only way to solve the problem, it isn't. And we need to look a hell of a lot harder into other solutions and that means people are going to have to get more involved. That means we're going to have to start having to have some more conversations. Um, I believe we have a lot more in common with our fe fellow Americans. Even if they are leftist, we can get them, if we're civil to them, we can get the leftists on our side, some of them, traditional leftists. Now, leftists that are in the cult that have no idea that whatever the hell they're talking about they parrot the party lines from the left or the right those are the ones we need to be aware or be wary of because what they are are zealots these guys don't care there is no convincing someone when you're part of a cult and whether you're left or right the cult exists in very stunning um scales that's the best way i could put it it's just it's just massive um, and if you don't believe me there, how many times have we had to try to convince people that, you know, a gun is just a tool? You know, nowadays you tell someone that and they'll be like, well, you're an anti-abortionist fascist. In reality, I am a person that, yeah, I am anti-abortion because I do see it as evil killing a human. But take that forward killing a human is like the last thing on my list that I want to do ever. And you had to push me to a level of I have no choice for me to go there. So I don't understand willingly going and getting, killing a life, period. To that end, that reflects in the 2A for me. I don't sit there and think about all the scenarios that could possibly happen and just stew and hope that I can punch my ticket. I may tease about that. Um, because, you know, being the first kid on my block, well, I'm 45 now, and I'm sure there's lots of other vets around here that would probably already have the, what I'm about to say, to be a, uh, to have a confirmed kill is where I go with that usually. But the point being is that I'm not afraid to do it if I have to. I've been training for the most part of my life, even though I am pudgy, <laughs> to, to run the drills, do what I need to do, and be proficient and accurate with firearms if I need to. There are a lot more people like me in the United States than there aren't. Um, there's a lot of ignorant people, and there's a lot of mental health issues in the United States that we really need to talk about. And I think you can see it with things like libs of TikTok. Um, you watch those libs of TikTok things, and my first thought is, how the hell are these people even allowed to exist? Where was the point in time that these people just didn't get a, a punch in the mouth? And yeah, I know violence isn't the answer to some things or to a lot of things. 
but it has solved a lot more crap in history than I care to admit. And this level of uh, mental health and scale of mental health issues is unfathomable even 10 years ago. To have someone break down because they have to work a eight-hour shift and they see that as so oppressive, that's not okay. These people are the ones that you're seeing perpetrate these heinous acts because they have other mental issues already. There is more to this issue than the gun. And no one, no one, we, we mention it in passing. Coley on the War mentions it in passing. But we're not having this honest conversation around mental health, destigmatizing the problems with mental health, and starting around getting people treatment and getting them fixed. If you're wanting to save lives, that's probably your biggest bang for your buck. And we're leaving that on the table. Because we keep focusing and having to defend rights that should already be guaranteed. So we're not having the critical conversations around what's causing all the crap that we're seeing. And I think it's a couple fold here. Because I had a chance to talk to some law enforcement agents this week. Um, because I was out and about doing what I do. Um... I got to talk to some and they, they wholeheartedly agree. There is a mental health problem that's going on and they're seeing it more and more on the streets and there's a lot of crap surrounding um, fentanyl. Even in northwest New Mexico, um, there's at least one or two calls a night for someone who's OD'd on fentanyl. So it isn't marijuana. It isn't even the traditional drugs. It is fentanyl right now. That is the the scourge of the cr- the drug crime that we're seeing right now. How does that come across the, uh, our borders or into the United States? It's usually the it's coming to the United States, specifically in New Mexico, from our southern border. Um, the leftists that run our con- our state have zero problems with um, illegal immigration. Now. I have a huge problem with this because this is where the libertarian part of me is way weirder than the others. I believe in borders, imaginary lines, because our country is a collection of cultures here that we have homogenized the best we can, and I think it's made us stronger in a lot of ways. But people coming across the border illegally don't share our culture or our values, They have different culture and different values than ours. And until they're willing to accept the culture and accept our values, I'm not willing to accept a ton of people in here. Now that sounds like being a a super traditionalist. No, it's me recognizing that if you allow bad things into your house, eventually bad things happen to you. And we need to control who comes into our house just a little bit. So, well, I control the, uh, to an extreme level who comes into my house. Um, and I think that's just as much what we need to do for the United States and for our state. Because we don't know what these people are doing. How many terror, you know, the, these are right-wing talking points, um, but they're correct. We don't know how many terrorists are cruising across the border. We don't know how much fentanyl is coming across there. And at the same time, we know that human trafficking trafficking is a thing. We've seen it. Uh, if you've lived in New Mexico for a long time, you know about it. You've seen it firsthand. And when I say that, more often than not, law enforcement guys are telling us about it. They're the ones that are you know, breaking. And I'm hard on New Mexico law enforcement because they've been given too much power by the state to do things that I don't believe they should or should be able to do. Um, I bring up the COVID lockdown all the time. I honestly hear every night on the scanner. I listen to the scanner in the background of what I do so I can be abreast of the situations that are going on. Um, You run into, not because I live in a bad neighborhood, but you run into a place a couple times that you normally get to and there's some sort of stupid situation going on because some idiot lost their damn marbles, 
you start wanting to find out what the hell is going on more and more. And with the situation that was going on in Ferguson is what started me doing this. And I hear every night how law enforcement is doing their job. And it's disappointing to think that I was once what I would call a bootlicker and a blue no, back to blue no matter what. It was that startling event where we had the state PD come up and the people that we elected in New Mexico did nothing to stop that or curb that, especially for as long as it was going on. That's what opened my eyes a hell of a lot to how far the government will go to oppress you. And with bills like this stuff coming up more and more, it shows that the American people are putting enough pressure on the right places that you're seeing people that are fed up, pissed off, getting heard by their reps and their senators. I only wish it was in New Mexico. But we have a session that ends March 18th. Um, check out New Mexico Shooting Sports Association if you want a better update than what I was able to give you. Um, they are very much in it to win it. These guys will go there at every rally I've ever seen. And while I have not been able to get to the roundhouse as much as I wanted to this session, um, and probably won't be able to unless it gets to where we have to be there to, to speak up, um, I don't believe it's going to do much good. In that New Mexico is stupid. Um, it, it is a very good possibility that the assault weapons ban, quote unquote assault weapons ban and magazine ban gets overturned in federal court in California and in Illinois. And New Mexico's uh, blind rep representatives and senators are going to go ahead and try to enact this stuff and just put a financial burden, burden because we'll then have standing where we're going to sue the hell out of them. And I hope that, and when I say we, I mean a New Mexico Shooting Sports Association, New Mexicans in general specifically, and that when we sue them, since New Mexico is always hurting for cash, we cause them enough damage. I'm saying we sue every gun owner that this could affect gets signed on to the cases that they're going to do and then we sue the individuals from Grisham down. Anyone that was on the super PAC uh, council or committees that voted yes on this, we sue them individually. Because this is how Scientology won their tax-free status. I'm not a Scientologist, but it makes a lot of sense to cause as much pain legally as you can to a state especially a poor one because all those suits add up and if it causes enough bleed of finances to um, New Mexico specifically they'll back off and it, I think it's hilarious that they're still put pursuing this with great vigor because of what the governor said and considering the Bruin case the Bruin decision um considering the thing, the Heller decision, they keep wanting to try to push these things down where there are time and time again where legal constraints have come back and bit them and said, you can't do this. Now, they've temporarily allowed, uh, there's a couple circuits that have allowed the magazine ban and the assault weapons ban because as they see it, it is um, the state's right to le register, uh, register or legalize or see if these firearms are legal. To some degree, I agree with that. But on the other hand, these should be protected not only statewide, but federally, because this was part of our background, our culture of becoming a country. And trying no, ma no amount of crime that's going on means that we should be stomping out rights in any way, shape, or form. Nor should we be giving them up. And now is the time where we just say, you're, you're irrelevant, government. We're done. I think gun control is gonna, has been dead for a long time, and I'll, I will cover that again in a later series. Um, I have droned on long enough to give you an update 
But I think Monday we're seeing the fight being taken to uh, polit- politicians at the national and at the state levels across the country. I hope that New Mexico politicians have the spine to be able to say no or to drag this out long enough because that's how it usually happens in New Mexico, that it gets tabled. Um, we only have, you know, a few more, what, well, two more weeks that this week, so three more weeks before they have to start making some uh, progress on these. There's a lot of other bills that are on the, the Senate and the House floor that they're dragging out that are going to take more time, uh, specifically around funding for different items, specifically around uh, K-12 education stuff. Back in the gap, I used to be more abreast of those situations. To be honest, the K-12s don't don't factor for where I'm thinking nowadays. Um, not working for them. Uh, my my youngest son is 16, and it looks like, depending upon what happens with uh, what we're seeing, we're probably going to have to homeschool him. Um, COVID broke him. I don't think that it's uh, a fair assessment to put him in public school and see how well he thrives when uh, there are a lot of people that are still in K-12s have checked out. And it's time for me to be a parent and step up and say, no, I'm taking care of my son. So my youngest has a little bit. He loves the welding program that's there, but I'm pretty sure I can find him a way to get access to welding. Um, that's been his big thing that's kept him in school. But he's locked motiv- lost motivation for anything else but it. And I think he sees it as pointless. And I understand why. Until you start trying to open a business and start doing some weird things with math and chemistry, um, legal things with both. Um, Specifically, I was trying to figure out molarity and concentration of some of my product lines that are going, going, going to be going out the door. And I did this with mathematics that I learned in high school. And it seems to be holding out fairly well. So anyone that says you don't use chemistry, high school chemistry, or high school algebra, or algebra 2, or calculus, they're full of crap. They just don't know how, they've never used it themselves because they have always thought of it as easier to do it this way. Uh, But one plus one way, the quick way, the math way, um, the the entry level math way. Advanced mathematics allows you to do a lot of critical thinking. And the same thing goes with science. And with that, that's what makes me so critical of all these things coming down because I'm looking at them at one year, two year, five year, you know, replacement of what it should be or should we be seeing it again in the political space. I'm beginning to think that, you know, Luke Ronkowski said this a while back that all bills passed, and so does Thomas Massey, should have a sunset clause so that they're reheard and that they can see if they were effective at what they were designed to do. The other thing I think we should start getting into is that um, reading legislation in New Mexico specifically, it needs to be like one page, and it needs to be very specific, clear language on what they're trying to do. So enjoy your Monday. Like, share, subscribe. I'm on all podcasting platforms. The video version of this will be on Rumble. Um, I post from Monday through Thursday on Rumble, usually. Um, I took a break last week to see if we were getting more engagement. And because it's easier to do just the audio podcast for me, um, the podcast, the audio version of this is Monday through Friday. It's available on everything, Spotify, Apple, the only thing it's not available is Amazon. You can find my podcast, the audio version, on YouTube. Um, but as I get more advanced and I start showing more of the firearm stuff I do, I don't want to have to worry about blurring my magazine being dropped or um, taking the scope off of my AK so I can show that I can run it with irons because I have the type of mount that allows me to do that. Um, I don't want any of that misconstrued as as reconfiguring a weapon that is naturally in this configuration. Um, I don't believe that 
gun control is going anywhere. I think they're going to try really hard, and it is very possible it passes, but the amount of compliance is not going to be there, period, because we've all learned that compliance is not going to help us. So be great, have a good day, enjoy your Monday.